I'm excited. It's going to be a fun day. We have lots and lots of stuff to go through. Uh, for those of you, and that's most of you who he were here yesterday evening, uh, I know that you may have felt a little overwhelmed. Uh, there was a lot of data to take in. We'll be doing that again today. Uh, and it's going to be overwhelming, potentially, for some of you as we work through what is happening in the world, not just in the present, but in the past, to give us some context. As I was talking about yesterday, ideas have consequences. And we're going to be seeing that, indeed, that is the case. My area of specialty, uh, years and years ago, I focused a tremendous amount of my time on trying to understand global politics, the international dimension of, uh, of this idea of oneness. And we'll be talking about oneness in a few minutes. So this morning, I'm going to focus on that, specifically on the idea of the cult of world order. I want you to see politics, international politics specifically, as being more than just simply the the ideas of men, but that it has also a, a component, a spiritual dimension, that it claims to build heaven on earth, that it claims to be the way forward. It is, in a sense, an inversion of the biblical message that Jesus Christ is the one who builds heaven on earth. So why do we need to go into a, a topic like this? And this just reiterates some of what we talked about yesterday. I'm going to do that intentionally because we need to have that grounding. Number one, so that you're not uninformed about the direction of our society. And boy, in this day and age, that is so, so important. There is so much misinformation, so much hype. Uh, rumors abound. And not just rumors, we are, are constantly fed sensational and conflicting data points. If you're on social media, uh, and most of us are to some degree on some form of social media, you are bombarded with conflicting views. So that we can recognize when the culture is preaching to us, when even our political class is preaching to us. And if there's anything I have I've witnessed and watched during these last two years with COVID, is when our political class says something, gives us talking points, how all of a sudden, within a week to two weeks, my neighbors, my friends, oh, okay, there we go. Excellent, wow. All of a sudden, they're all using the same talking points. And I'm going, y where did that come from? I know where it came from. I know where it came from. And you didn't think of this. This wasn't in your thinking beforehand. This came through the pipeline. And so we need to recognize when we're being preached to and then to recognize and spot the worldview behind that so that we don't become gullible participants because if uh, that's, that's a key point. I have seen this over and over again. And we'll be giving examples of this. So our churches don't succumb to the, to the spirit of the age, so to speak. And when they do, when our, when our churches do adopt the world's point of view, when our denominations... Our Bible colleges, our seminaries start to adopt those worldviews. We actually have an understanding of where this is creeping in from because it's a top-down approach, not so much grassroots. And the big one, especially for this morning, to give us that historical context, to see all of this as a grand theme that continues from generation to generation, that none of this is a surprise of what we have seen in the last two years, a conversation around how we all need to see the world uniting around and combating COVID or climate change before that is actually a theme that you can trace. And that is that it, there is a big idea, the continuity of a big idea behind that. So as I was discussing yesterday, and I want to bring this up one more time, the importance of this very basic premise that there are only two worldviews, two ultimate paradigms. The one being oneism. It is the dominant worldview, which says that man, God, and nature are essentially the same. We are all one. We're one human family, one earth family, one cosmic family. There is no ultimate distinction at the core level between man, God, and nature. And of course, that is the worldview of Eastern mysticism. It is the worldview that comes through our culture in so many different ways 
that we are all one and have to operate as one. And then the biblical worldview, as we saw yesterday evening, is no, it's not. Reality is two. Not dualism that says there's an equal and opposite force, but two. God being distinct, absolutely unique, completely set apart, different than creation. And this is such a fundamental point that we need to keep in mind because how we view these two issues of reality will determine everything from our ethics and gender and culture, philosophy, and as we'll see, our politics. I'm going to give you a couple of passages just to set the tone because I think it's interesting how spiritual lies feed into how we as humanity engage, we operate. Genesis 3, the first lie, the one that we all now live under, the one that we all constantly um, deal with in terms of our spiritual DNA, is when the deceiver comes to Adam and Eve, comes to Eve first and then to Adam, you will not surely die for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like or as God, knowing good and evil. This is oneism in its very foundational, in the very foundation of it, uh, where you can be as God. There is a divine likeness, a, a similarity where we engage essentially in divine identity theft. And then here's another really interesting little point of spiritual lies, how and we see this in Revelation 16, how words are whispered in to the minds of men and women who have great power, national power. Revelation 16, 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. There's a whispering. It's not just simply that man is in rebellion against God. There is a supernatural side that's in rebellion as well. And at some point, this corresponds. This, this crosses over. And as we see in the first lie and the last lie, it is about this battle against God, essentially saying creation is divine. Isaiah 43 gives us some context about who God really is and where salvation truly is found. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say, it is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. As I just said yesterday evening, and I hope that you're going to see politics in a different light, especially global politics, as not just simply a form of, of management or governance, but as an alternative salvation claim. That if we can unify our politics, we can somehow bring peace to the earth and save humanity as we save the planet. That comes out loud and clear as you go through the, the green movement, which we did yesterday. And we'll see that now again as we go into the realm of global governance. And the reason I called it a cult of world order is because it is a cult. It has an aspiration that is messianic, and it even has its own eschatology, the end of the world. If we don't save the world, we will see its destruction. So Gordon Brown, in the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, early part of 2020, Gordon Brown, the former um, prime minister of the UK, called out that what we need to tackle the corona problem, what we need to tackle, uh, how we have to tackle this is through a system of world government. And so he urged leaders to bring about a temporary, a temporary form of world government. Well, I don't know if, if you've ever seen any government program that really remains temporary. Uh, GST is a great example, right? For those of us who remember when GST was temporary, income tax, temporary. And, and that's obviously, I mean, that's part of the clash we're seeing right now. As I, I mean, today the clash over what is temporary versus when we let this go. 
we don't want to we don't want to see government continue 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 because that seems to be the case so i, I kind of chuckle when i think of gordon brown saying we're going to have temp a temporary world government mm -hmm. right not for one minute do i believe it'll be temporary because that's not the nature of government it is it is its own industry but gordon brown was this he was you know calling this out what we need is a form of global governance to tackle the corona issue and then of course the world economic forum the great reset and build back better and i know we've heard this on your social media i know you've run into this over and over again what is the great reset what is this build back better what is the world economic forum we're going to be talking about this towards the back side of this presentation but i want to just bring this up front a little bit as well so i was Myself and, and another Canadian researcher by the name of Audrey van der Klee, we both have done a lot of research projects together. And last year when the World Economic Forum held their Davos agenda, the two of us devoted the entire week to monitoring and reporting in real time what was happening during the World Economic Forum's virtual event, because it was virtual and that allowed us to have that access. And so that week, I uh, would we think the two of us each dedicated about 60 hours. We were up at two in the morning because it starts in Europe, European time, and we would go till right till lunchtime and it was heavy duty slogging as we were working through what in the world are our world leaders saying. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that later, but the important part is that there is a recognition. Oh, I just had a little, there we go, let's see. All right, the United Nations Secretary General during last year's World Economic Forum said this, what we need is one global economy with universal respect for... International. Ah, thank you, international law. <laughs> I didn't realize that all of a sudden a Davos symbol popping in front of me. Thank you very much, World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. And then the president of the Swiss Confederation, when he opened up the World Economic Forum last year, said this, a crisis is a productive event. And we were told that repeatedly, that a crisis is productive. And indeed it is, because it allows you to move forward agendas, concepts, and ideas that would not be considered without some form of crisis. Mm -hmm. The leader of China in his address to the World Economic Forum last year said this, there's only one earth and one shared future for humanity. As we cope with the current crisis and endeavor to make a better day for everyone, we need to stand united and work together. We have been showing time and again that to beggar thy neighbor, to go it alone and to slip into arrogant isolation will always fail. Let us all join hands and let multilateralism light our way toward a community with a shared future for mankind. Lots of political gobbledygook, um, but it is a grand kumbaya. We need to unite. We need to come together. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I monitored the World Economic Forum again as they held their <laughs> conference virtually. And the, and the leader of China made it quite clear that what we need to do is not sail the ocean in our individual boats, but we all need to build and be on the same big ship together as we sail through the storms of coronavirus and climate change. But whose idea do we follow? Which model do we follow, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to address the concept of our unity. And I want to demonstrate this biblically, that there is a foundation behind this. And yes, we're going to be looking at the, at the Tower of Babel story in the book of Genesis. And in giving us some context, I think we'll have a better grasp of just how the shadow of the tower, this idea of human unity, continues to fall on us today. We're not divorced from this. This isn't something that has that disappeared off the pages of the Bible. And I have to ask the question, what is the first city in the Bible? Does anybody know? What is the first named city? I know you want to say Babel. Any, any other guesses? First city in the Bible. Was it Cain and Eden? <laughs> nope, not Garden of Eden. Cain. Cain was the one who builds it. And he built it and named it after his son, Enoch. We see the story in Genesis chapter 4. Just to give you some context, in Genesis chapter 4, Cain has killed Abel. And God has punished him with the curse of wandering. That is literally to be without a homeland, to be separated, to be removed. 
Cain is terrified by this punishment. And so God promises Cain that he, God, would be Cain's security. He would be Cain's security. But your curse is to wander. And God is, I will be your security during this time. So what was Cain's response to that? He built a city. He builds a city. He builds a place secured by his own hands, and he calls it Enoch, named after his son. Now, we don't know how big the population of the world is at the time. We don't know the age of Cain or Abel. We don't know if there are already generations that have come with, uh, within that lifetime life t- uh, because we know that they have prolonged years of living. But he is able to build a city. There's a meaning behind that. There's an understanding behind that. And Jacques Ellul, who's a French theologian, I don't understand a lot of what he says because some of it is just like poof, over my head. But he has some really interesting perspectives on the meaning of the city, going back to Cain. The city for Cain is first of all the place where he can be himself, his homeland, the one settled spot in his wanderings. Second, it is a material sign of his security. He is responsible for himself. For God's Eden, he substitutes his own. For the goal given to his life, he substitutes a goal chosen by himself. Just as he substitutes his own security for God's. As we consider the cult of world order, we see that it essentially parallels this. We don't need God's security. We find our own security. We create our own security. We build our own security. Elul goes on. When man is faced with a curse, he answers, I'll take care of my problems alone. And he puts everything to work to become powerful, to keep the curse from having its effects. He creates the arts and the sciences. He raises an army. He constructs chariots. He builds cities. The spirit of might is a response to the divine curse. And Elul goes on to talk about what the, the symbolic meaning of, this, of the city, what it represents. It is man's attempt at self-security. It is where we place our idols, the idols of our money, our power, our strength. It is where we make our name. It is our place of pride. And it is. If you actually really consider what the spirit of the city represents, this is what it becomes. It is where we collectively affirm our independence. It is our artificial Eden. It is our artificial heaven on earth. It is both a symbol and a setting to declare our own order. And when you really unpack what the purpose of the city is, you see this, which is really interesting because whatever man has caused to fall in our sin nature, Christ himself still redeems. And if you go into the book of Revelation, you see that there is a a city, a final redeemed city, that comes to earth. And it is the new Jerusalem. It is heaven on earth, but not constructed by man's hands, constructed by Christ himself. The city is redeemed. It's flipped. What man intends for his own purpose, God will eventually turn for his. So Genesis 11, here we have the the story of the Tower of Babel. And this is important to the conversation because what we'll see is a The politics that we'll be talking about, in a sense, is a reflection of this tower, is a reflection of the the concept behind it of unity. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a, a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city. It's interesting. We always focus on the tower. We forget that there's actually a city. There's an entire complex built around this. It's not just simply a tower out in the desert. This is a community, a unified community. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. 
So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So there's a few things happening. There's one original language. They propose to build a city tower complex. We build upwards. That's what we do. Symbolically, we build upward. And the purpose is to reach into the highest heavens, specifically to make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered. There is a sense of fame and renown in what we're doing. In verse 6, we see the line, what they begin. The transliteration of the Hebrew is shalal. It means to profane or defile. So what they are beginning to do is literally an act of of profanity in God's eyes. It is defiling his purpose. In verse 6, we also see the, the language of this is going to be withheld from them, um, that there will be nothing impossible. Again, the transliteration in the Hebrew gives us a sense of fortification. That's what's taking place. Fortification, making this inaccessible. We are putting up our walls to God. We are gathering against him and putting our walls up. We don't need his security. We have our own. And then God comes down and imposes judgment. And the project stops. And I, I believe, I totally believe that God extends grace in this story. Because the flavoring behind it is, if allowed to continue on, judgment would be even more severe. And so when man builds and unifies and said, this is our order, and this is what we do, and God does not belong here, at some point God intervenes and brings forth justice, and with it, it is also an act of grace. Which all of a sudden brings us right back around to Revelation, and we see Christ coming to bring judgment, and it is also, too, an act of grace. But it is judgment against mankind unified. So a few things pop up. There's solidarity and self-naming. We define our purpose. We define our meaning. We define our order. There's a form of declared independence from God. We frame our own security. This is achieved through the power of our unity. It is the faith that we have in our own works, the faith that we have in ourselves. This is collective idolatry, not just individual idolatry. This is now collective idolatry. So, the concept that grows out of this is something called cosmopolis. I have a chapter in my book on this concept of, of cosmopolis. And Warren Wagner, a uh, um, kind of a philosophical uh, thinker of the 1950s and 60s, he wrote about the city of man in 1963. And this is what he said. Now, he was not a Christian. He's advocating mankind coming together under one roof. The world city is the inevitably large spiritual and intellectual and administrative capital of a civilization, of the whole known civilized world. Or, more broadly, it is the quintessence of a civilization, the gathering of all its vital human resources into a living, organic unity. Cosmopolis is simply the world in a state of optimal integration. He went on to, to say, men must think and feel as one before they can make the leap to Cosmopolis. Cosmopolis. This is just the tower and the city complex of Genesis casting its shadow into today. Before him, Benjamin Kidd, a British philosopher, talked about how we, what we needed to do was advance the law of integration, that man individually would integrate within our groups, and then our groups would integrate into something more universal, and we would therefore become one in our power, in our collective human power. So this is what he wrote. This is 1918. Civilization is absolutely invincible once it realizes the secret of its own unity. Power in its highest expression is a science of organizing the individual mind in the service of the universal. Truth is nothing else than this science of power. Pretty, uh, pretty telling. I, I read, I read, ben, and I've read a number of Benjamin Kidd's, uh, a number of his books. He, he wrote two or three of books. I've read them. I've read some of his essays. Um, 
this is the worldview, uh, especially built around World War I. Uh, we now need to come together. And so I'm going to show you some symbolic representations of the Tower of Babel and how it's not just something political, it is also demonstrated in our architecture. And this is an interesting little rabbit trail. And I, I teach a course at Miller College. I, I mentioned this yesterday. And I offer them more examples than just what we're seeing here today. But this will suffice. So in 1913, 1913, an architect by the name of Hendrik Andersen had proposed to the world that what we need is a global capital, a global capital for our cosmopolis, for this world state, this world city. So he proposed an international world capital, and the blueprints for that went all over the place. It went into the, put, was put in the hands of kings and, and presidents and prime ministers. I have a copy of the proposal in my office back in Plumas, uh, and all of the signatures that went behind it. It was really believed that this is, we're gonna be entering an age when man builds heaven on earth. And so this would be a city tower complex. And in the center of the city would be called the Tower of Progress, standing at over a thousand feet high. And surrounding it would be international congresses for science, halls of justice, a temple of religions, an international bank, Anderson said this, the tower, which will form the chief feature of both center and city, was conceived as symbolic of our faith in unity. He continued, a change is now felt throughout the entire world. A divine responsibility governs our actions. As we are one with the past, so must we be one with the future. Man's strength can only come through world unification, peace, and fellowship, a grander coalescence, a world centralization. And this is a picture from that project of his. And you see there the world tower and the world city. Humanity rises in majestic dignity from earth to heaven, the embodiment of the universal soul mounting in appealing harmony towards the divine source of life. Humanity's mission is to realize that kingdom of heaven on earth, visioned from within by the spirit of man. We build our Babel, we build our tower, and we proclaim our own dependence and our security, and we call that heaven on earth. So what happened after 1913? World War, I. World War I, yes, the guns of August, kaboom, and the project just disappears as mankind engages in the first true industrial slaughterhouse. Another example, the European Union. Uh, there's a famous painting by uh, P uh, Peter Bruegel of the Tower of Babel. And then in the 1980s, the European community put out their poster, Europe, many tongues, one voice, mirroring Peter Bruegel's famous painting. This is the European project. We're coming together in our unity. Look what we can achieve together. We will build our tower. It's interesting how this imagery is embedded within the European project. Here's another example from the European Union. This is the European Parliament's Lux Prize, given out every year to uh, uh, people invol involved in the film industry whose works demonstrate unification and Europe working together in harmony. This is from their fact sheet on the Lux Prize. In Latin, Lux means light. The concept underlying the Lux Prize visual identity is the Tower of Babel. Beyond the aesthetics of the place painted, among others, by Peter Bruegel, the prize puts a positive interpretation on this myth. Like cinema and European integration, the Tower of Babel is a symbol of history being written, where linguistic and cultural diversity join forces, permitting a common European culture to emerge. It's just a story, right? No. No, it was, it was an event, and it still is an event that beats in our collective hearts. Because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be doing this. Here's one that's a little closer to home. Okay, who here has taken the time to tour the, the, the museum? Yep, a few of you. Incredible, isn't it? What an amazing piece of architecture. The first time I walked into it, I went, wow, this would make an awesome water park or great for paintball. I mean, this would be wild. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, that's me. But uh, yeah, it, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal building. Architecture Week in 2011, 
said this, the Museum for Human Rights finds its archetype in the Biblical Tower of Babel, described in the book of Genesis. Annie Predock, uh, the architect behind the museum, puts it this way, that this building is rooted in humanity, making visible in the architecture the fundamental commonality of humankind, a symbolic apparition of ice, clouds, and stone set in a field of sweet grass, the creation of a unifying and timeless landmark for all nations and cultures of the world. Now, Predock is really an interesting character, a phenomenal architect, no question, but he's, he's, he's did all kinds of interesting things. He's, he's designed stuff in here that some of it is not known to the public unless you start talking to people who've had some connection directly to this building. Um, for those of you who've been there, you know when you walk in, you walk in at the basement level, uh, it's a big blank open basement. It's a big open area. Cement, it's dull looking. You're in the, you're in the guts of it, the roots of the building, so to speak. Off in one corner, there's a, sc a spot where the walls kind of converge and it gives you like a, almost like a little square. And I found this out from talking to, to one of the people who works at the, at the uh, museum. And um, Predock designed it in such a way that it is astronomically aligned with the sun. And so when the winter solstice happens, and as long as it's not cloudy, for only a brief moment, the sun will shine through into that window because it looks like it's just a wall, but the way it's all angled allows a shaft of sunlight to break through and illuminate the darkness of the basement. And it's symbolic. It has a meaning behind it. So when he opened up, when the museum was opened up, Predator actually went to the top floor and he walked backwards against the tide of people coming in, going upwards, because he wanted to see the expressions on their face and to see whether this was resonating with them or not. Interesting, interesting stuff. So yes, we were told at the Museum of Human Rights that human rights are ever-changing in our interconnected world. Really? Really? What happens when our human rights are ever-changing? What does that mean? There's some problems with that. On the second, in the second uh, floor, uh, up from the basement, you walk through this timeline of human rights, and Zoroaster is the, the he's the fellow in the in the white headdress. He's considered the father of human rights. Then Jesus of Nazareth is there, and Karl Marx is there, and they're all listed along, side by side. Dem yes, Karl Marx demonstrating the progression of our human rights. And then as you climb up and up and up you go uh, on these walkways with this backlit alabaster stone imported from Italy. I mean, there was no expense spared on this building. Eventually you arise up to the Tower of Hope. You ascend literally, symbolically and literally from darkness to light. Who paid for this thing? You did. You did. And you will continue to pay as long as you live. And then your children will pay and your grandchildren will pay to infinity. It would make a great water park. How much did we pay? 400 and some million. And then I think it's 25 to 35 million a year to keep this place open. Yes, but if you're not vaccinated, you don't go right now. That human rights is denied you. <laughs> So humanity united. We just saw a symbolic aspect of this. Let's get into some more of the more of the political side to demonstrate that the tower, the shadow falls over us. So in World War One, and I can trace this way back before World War One, but in World War One we see an interesting change in the mentality of our elites. So Nicholas Murray Butler, who was then Mr. International, he was the kind of person who had the ear of kings and prime ministers queens and parliamentarians. He, put, he said this in 1914, and then the next year in 1915, regarding the war situation. The time will come when each nation will deposit in a world federation some portion of its sovereignty for the general good. When this happens, it will be possible to establish an international executive and international police, both devised for the special purpose of enforcing the decisions of the international court. And he recognized that the, the crisis of World War I opened up opportunity. So he said this, the world order changed when this war storm broke. 
The old world order died with the setting of that day's sun, and a new world order is being born while I speak. In World War I, during that time, Christians thought it was their duty to advance the idea of a righteous internationalism. So progressive Christians, back then they were called social gospel ministers, were very involved in helping to shape the political thinking around the development of a League for Nations, which first was called the League to Enforce Peace. Then it became the League of Nations. So one of the architects, Frederick Lynch, a minister, in his book, The Challenge, The Church and the New World Order, published in 1916, described how Christians need to come together and form a compact or League of Nations or some sort of United Nations of the world. This is 1916. Then Samuel Batten, a, uh, a Baptist minister and a social gospel preacher, in his book, The New World Order, 1919, writes this. If there is to be a new world, it must first come of all, pardon me, it must come first of all through a new spirit in the nations. There must be created an international mind and conscience. Men must learn to think of humanity as one family and to have a world patriotism. World patriotism must be a faith. International peace must become an aspiration, a religion, before it becomes a reality. It is a cult. This is a cult. This is a political cult, but it is absolutely, nevertheless, a, has a spiritual dimension to it. So the next big crisis, World War II. We see progressive Christians, we see churches and entire denominations pushing hard for world government, for a righteous internationalism. The Federal Council of Churches put this statement out. The ultimate requirement is a duly constituted world government of delegated powers, an international legislative body, an international court with adequate powers and adequate international police forces and provisions for worldwide economic sanctions. No thank you. No thank you. But Christians, churches were involved in a significant way. The Methodist Council of Bishops had a crusade for world order. The Northern Baptist Convention had a world order crusade. And here you thought George Bush Sr. coined the phrase new world order. Not even close. Here's a statement from the 1946 Southern Baptist Convention. We believe that the goal of peacemakers must be a world organized on the Christian principles of order and justice. We further believe that in the field of international relations, such a goal can be accomplished only by some type of world government. Accordingly, we, re we recommend that Southern Baptists endorse the principle of world federation. So when the world pulls a, a chair out for us and says, join us at the table, we do it to our own shame as we look to rebuild the tower in our own image. Then in the 1940s, a number of world government and world federalist groups joined together to create the United World Federalist. And they eventually became the World Federalist Association in the United States and the World Federalist Movement of Canada. And in 1947, this grew to 315 chapters, had 40,000 general members, judges, politicians, priests, educators, truckers, welders, the average layperson joined. This was going to be our way forward. We would have some effective form of world government. This is how we would overcome the problem of our crises. Even the Pope agreed with it. Um, in 1951, the movement for world federal government met in Rome for one of their uh, annual conventions and had met with the Pope, Pope Pius XII. And it took me a while to find this, by the way. Uh, I first heard about this when I was uh, in Washington, D.C. at a, a joint meeting between the World Federalist Association and the United Religions Initiative, which was looking to try to create a United Nations of Religions. And they held a joint meeting in a large Methodist church. It was a Methodist church that at the time Bill Clinton was attending, just a few blocks from the White House. And during that event, we were told, hey, look, we were already gathering with religious leaders in the 1950s. Churches were already on board with us back then. And so we were given uh, a little bit of the backstory. And it took, me, it took me quite a long time to find the actual statement from Pope Pius XII. And I eventually dug it up uh, out of a Catholic seminary in the Midwest. So this is what Pope Pius XII said. Your movement, gentlemen 
has a task of creating an effective political organization of the world. There is nothing more in keeping with the traditional doctrines of the church, or better adapted to her teachings on the rightful or unjust war, especially in the present world situation. An organization of this nature must, therefore, be set up. A pretty strong endorsement. And then in the 1950s, churches across the U.S. were encouraged to hold World Government Sundays. And so this is a, a, a picture. I have the document in my, in my office. This is the picture. I, I, I pulled this from the uh, World Federalist Archives, which are, are held in Indiana. Um, and World Government Sunday was a nationwide campaign. Approximately 500 church leaders just from Southern California were asked to deliver sermons on world government. And so this little brochure kind of gives some outlines. Here's some, some text for, for sermon. This is some of the outlines for, for you as a pastor to engage in. Here's some resources that you can use, some thoughts, uh, suggested thought, emphasize the need to undergird any attempt of world government with a sound faith, etc., etc. So here you are, pastors. Here you go, ministers. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel of Babel. That's ultimately what this is. What we've been seeing in the last two years, what we have been experiencing, it's not new. We're just now feeling it. It's now close to home and you can't ignore it. But honestly, we've been engaging in these little processes for decades and decades. From a humanist point of view, Bertrand Russell, very important philosopher of the last century, in fact, considered to be the most influential philosopher, one of the most influential philosophers, philosophers of the last century, put it this way in his book, The Future of Science. This is 1959. I believe that owing to men's folly, a world government will only be established by force and will therefore be at first cruel and despotic. But I, but I believe that it is necessary for the preservation of a scientific civilization and that if once realized, it will gradually give rise to, another, uh, to other conditions of a tolerable existence. Uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. We've kind of almost been living a little bit of that. No, thank you. I, I don't like it. Not one bit. In 1953, he said this, I do not pretend that birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing. There are others. War, as I remarked a moment ago, has hitherto been disappointing in this respect. But perhaps bacteriological war may prove more effective. If a black death could be spread throughout the world once in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. There would be nothing in this to offend the conscience of the devout or to restrain the ambitions of nationalists. The state of affairs might be somewhat unpleasant, but what of that? Really high-minded people are indifferent to happiness, especially other people's. That is a true statement. A scientific world society cannot be stable unless there is a world government. That's the thinking that existed already at that point. This is the 1950s. In fact, indeed, Winston Churchill, after World War II, traveled the world preaching the importance of world government. This is from his speech at Albert Hall in 1947. The creation of an authoritative, all-powerful world order is the ultimate aim towards which we must strive. Unless some effective world supergovernment can be set up and brought quickly into action, the prospects for peace and human progress are dark and doubtful. I'm giving you all this to demonstrate that what we have been hearing, what you see, is not in a vacuum. Ideas have consequences. And these ideas have been in circulation for some time. My first world government research, so to speak, in a significant way was me calling up the Department of Foreign Affairs, our Department of Foreign Affairs, in 1995, because I saw in the Winnipeg Free Press an itty-bitty article about how Canada's foreign policy in 1995, and this is our official foreign policy that year, our Liberal government foreign policy, was to help the United Nations to construct its own military force, to give, its, to give it its own intelligence apparatus, to use a form of world taxation to pay for all of this and put it all under the command and control of the United Nations Secretary General. 
The research behind this was really easy. I literally picked up the phone and said, can I have a copy? That's all you have to do. Yes, absolutely. Can I have two then? For sure. Fantastic. <laughs> and it's in English and, you know, I got it all nicely highlighted. And of course it's in French because that's what we are, right? So this is 1995. Mm. We were absolutely asleep at the wheel. You think that somehow this is all something future projected. Uh, no, it's been a lived out, thought out idea since Genesis. So my first taste of this in a significant way, besides what I talked about um, last night, uh, and I had been to a couple of World Federalist events before this event, but my first taste at the United Nations within a UN-based event was at the United Nations Millennium Forum in the year 2000. You have to understand, the year 2000 was significant. The hopes and dreams of mankind was built around the idea that we could all come together in the year 2000. That was the hope. Did it happen? Of course not. But there's always this projection. This is what we are working towards. So that's my UN security clearance that I had for that event. Um, I always had to carry that with me. I had another card that went along, a colorized card, and, and it, that allowed me to get in the doors and to go to all the different... Uh, subforums and the different working groups at the Millennium Forum. And I was part of what's called Subgroup 6, which was to strengthen and democratize the United Nations, to basically brainstorm what a new world would look like, what a new international order would entail. And so over the course of that week, we just talked a lot about constructing world laws, establishing a global parliament, creating a United Nations controlled police force, that all this required a global tax. We talked about carbon taxes back then before the Liberal government was giving you carbon taxes. It's not Justin Trudeau's idea. It filters down from events like this and thought process like this. And in all this, we were talking about how we need the United Nations to oversee the world's financial system. This was our discussion. This was our talking points. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that they're always on track. It doesn't even mean that they get along. So I'll give you an example. Um, during the course of that event, I was sitting fairly close to, during every day we had two plenary sessions. And I always somehow sat close to this lady from um, a third world country. I'm not going to say where she's from. Um, wonderful, wonderful lady. We always got along. We talked, just something clicked. And we talked usually every day. Hey, how are you doing? You know, was your sessions interesting yesterday? Because she was at a different working group. So on Thursday, she came to me and she says, Carl, my working group is stalled. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just bogged down in, in minute details. It's boring. Where are you going? I said, I'm part of subgroup six, which is redesigning world order. Come with me. So she came with me. And I talk about it in my book. I give you the, the story because it, it really was interesting. And that day, we were having a massive discussion on the creation of a global parliament. Okay? And the room was full of people. And the moderators had their own version of what world government and a world parliament would look like. And as the event dragged on all afternoon, it became increasingly more confrontational. Because everybody in the room wants the same thing, but you all have different agendas. You all have your own organizations. You all have your egos and your budget lines that have to be met. So even though you're on the same page for the end goal, you sure aren't on the same page on how to get there. And at one point, the lady that was sitting beside me, she was physically shaking. And you could tell she was very disturbed. And the moderator stopped it all and pointed and said, you, you've got a problem. And she just froze. She was like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. And, and composed herself. And then when it was all done and said, we all left. And of course, the moderators, the, the people who were organizing it all had their way anyways. The gavel came down and they, by consensus, confirmed that this would be the direction forward. And everybody muttered, you know, in their own disgust as they had their own agendas squashed. Yeah, real consensus. Anyways, I walked out with her and she's under her breath going, this is the beast. This is the Antichrist. Really? Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Now, then all of a sudden, there's a reason why all week long we were connecting. Mm. There was a reason. 
So I'm like, why are you here? So she gave me her story. It's an interesting little backstory. I won't get into it. I, was, I told her why I was there as a researcher. How I had gone undercover, so to speak, because I had been brought in underneath the umbrella of the World Federalist as an independent expert on globalization. So it was really, really interesting to see how they don't all get along. Mm -hmm. So Tessie Adron, who was the chairperson of the UN Millennium Forum, opened up by saying this, as this new millennium begins, we are all increasingly coming to realize that in our diversity, we are one human family. The only way we can survive the challenges ahead is to stand together. In this regard, we have no choice but to follow this path of global inclusion and to recognize and affirm our essential oneness. Back to oneness. And so these are just a few snippets from different circulated texts. Um, subgroup 5 asks the question, is it time now to consider a world uh, environmental agency or a world bank or a world government? Um, one of the other declarations that circulated said religious and spiritual dialogues are needed to promote shared ethics and values in service to the United Nations. The UN Association of Spain released this statement, a, a global world requires global responses and a system of world government. I didn't bring the document. I thought I did. Nope. Shoot. Oh, well. It's here on the screen. So one of the documents that was handed to us was entitled Transformation of the World. It wasn't a UN document, but it was handed out by one of the delegates um, from uh, Kazakhstan. And in the document, we have a world king. I, I scanned it from inside the document. We have a world king metering out justice and peace being the fulcrum between power and people. And this is what the document says. And as Christians, this should all of a sudden spark something in you. The world does need a civilized coordinator in international relations and in settling global problems. More than that, this coordinator must be a stabilizing factor, actually the last ditch authority on the earth. He must win confidence of each man and each nation. People must be stark sure that this coordinator would solve any problem in a just and humane way. And one should be sure that in him we would find understanding and sympathy, that he would treat any nation as his own son. Can the world community do without a coordinator? Mm -hmm. Definitely not. <laughs> and then I will take you real quickly to Winnipeg. Because in 2012, I attended the World Federalist Movement's 26th International Congress. They hold it every four to five years in cities around the world. The Hague, Rome, as I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, Paris, London. Uh, and in 2012, they came to Winnipeg. <laughs> ah, I know, we should all be saying, like, what? <laughs> Winnipeg? Like, Winnipeg, I mean, if you're going to come to Winnipeg as a world place, you might as well come to you know, I mean, Portage or Gladstone or Plumas. You know, in the grand scheme of things, that's all Winnipeg is. Compared to Chicago or New York uh, or Tokyo, what is Winnipeg, right? What is Winnipeg? Why Winnipeg? One man's name, Lloyd Axworthy. Because Lloyd Axworthy was at that point the international president of the World Federalist Movement. Okay. Does this start ringing a bell now? Lloyd Axworthy uh, being the president of the University of Winnipeg was before that Canada's ambassador to the United Nations. Before that, he was our Minister of, of International Relations and Foreign Affairs. So it gets right close to home, guys. So off I went with a, an intern. I had an intern that summer, and we listened to the same thing that we had talked about back in 2000, that what we need is a democratic world parliament. We need to give the United Nations legal powers. We need a carbon tax and have all this waiting in the wings for the next world crisis. And over and over again, we were told that we have to unite before we destroy each other. And this is just one of the handouts. How are we going to get to the top of, of World Federation, this mountaintop that we want? Well, we have crisis and opportunity. The crisis of wars and disasters that are always looming. And then we have these related activities that shine the light on where we need to go. We're going to do this through education, raising our consciousness, world citizenship movements. Education is so important along this line. And then we have these different pathways. Maybe we can have a world constitution or transform the UN integrate the, un uh, the, the, the regions or unite the democracies, which, by the way, Biden has been talking about. That was part of his Build Back Better early on in his administration. My friend Olivia, who was my intern that summer, said this, 
All of us present at the Congress were told that we are waiting for that one historic tipping point. It will be at that tipping point when world government will seem more acceptable to the now hesitant nation states, for it will seem more necessary to ensure human survival. I can't help but view this with horror and confusion, horror at the thinly veiled hope of for crisis and confusion at the mixed message this sends. As the week unfolded and I heard more and more references to the need for a crisis in order to unify, I realized that the leaders of the World Federalist Movement were very aware of the same issue I was. In our efforts to unite, we may have to destroy each other. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll give you one more quick example because there is a religious component before we jump back into the uh, World Economic Forum. Again, held in Winnipeg, hosted by World Federalists. Um, each year that the G8 and G20 get together at the political side, there is an interfaith component. Religious leaders around the world come together, they have an interfaith event where they work through what does, uh, what, do, what, do, what should the policies be? What does this look like? And so that happened in 2010 at the University of Winnipeg. And so we had members of the Baha'i community, pagans. Uh, we had two ministers or two members of the Saudi Arabia Minister of Islamic Affairs join us with their big long robes, members of the Hindu Federation, the Tony Blair Faith, uh, Faith Foundation. The list went on. And we had lots of representation from within the realm of Christendom. Sojourners, National Council of Churches, Canadian Council of Churches, which, by the way, uh, was led by World Federalists at that time. Evangelical Fellowship of Canada was brought in as a strategic partner. I document this all. I have it in my book, Mennonite Church of Canada. We were all at the table. And nobody, nobody spoke in opposition. You don't. You're all part of it. You're all wrapped up in the energy of the event. So what were we discussing? I was there as an observer. It was really interesting. It was all about religious unity for a common good and world peace. We need a global financial infrastructure. We need a world taxation system. As the Salvation Army representative described it, it's not about having a bike for each. It's about learning to share one bike in community. No, thank you. We've tried that. It's called the Soviet Union. And the bike didn't work after a while. A lot of talk of eco-justice, having a gospel respecting the earth, we are the biggest parasites on earth, yada yada, back to what we talked about last night. And in all of this, we need somebody to manage it, and who is that? It has to be the United Nations or some other agency that can take its place. It's interesting when you consider the worldview of oneness as a religious component with the political side. This is from Lucille Green. She was a world federalist. She writes this. And by the way, she was a former uh, uh, missionary kid. A new consciousness is also emerging from a growing awareness in the West of the wisdom of the Eastern worldview, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, and Shinto. Perhaps we can learn through them to see the world whole as it really is, and together, West and East, begin to build the foundations of a new world order. The most urgent item on the planetary agenda is to set the limits of freedom and order in supranational global affairs. A constitution for the world is needed which combines the achievement of both hemispheres, that is, constitutional limitations and a bill of rights from the West and a spacious worldview from the East. So back real quick to the Great Reset, because only a few weeks ago, the Davos uh, virtual conference was once again held. We've heard lots about Build Back Better and the Great Reset. What does this ultimately mean? Well, it comes through the work of Carl, uh, Klaus Schwab. And in 1971, he formed the World Economic Forum, but back then it was called the European Management Forum because that's what this is about. Management, management, management. And it's known for the flagship event in Davos, the World Economic Forum. So who attends? Heads of state, our own prime minister, Biden is buddy-buddy with Klaus Schwab's, uh, Christina Freeland, who is our Minister of uh, Finances and our, our Deputy PM. Uh, she sits on the board of the World Economic Forum. Mark Carney, who is being quietly tapped to maybe be the next leader for the Liberals, who was the Governor of the Bank of Canada, then became a member of the Bank for International Settlements, then became, I believe, the Governor of the Bank of England before he was tapped to be, to be the UN uh, commissioner on global, or pardon me, on climate change. He's being tapped, possibly for the next position within the leadership of 
of the Liberal Party. He sits on the board of the World Economic Forum. So you, we can't divorce ourselves as a country with this. This is the policy. This is the thinking behind our national leadership, period. So that is the type of people that come together underneath the umbrella of the World Economic Forum. Uh, Visa, MasterCard, uh, Blackwater, uh, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, uh, literally a, an incredible amount, roughly a thousand CEOs of major and international corporations. This is truly a public-private partnership at the global level. Mm. So what was discussed at the last um, Davos Agenda Conference and then this week, uh, the UN uh, Economic and Social Council had their meeting on Build Back Better. Well, this, it's very simple. We can break it down this way. It's collectivism. What we need is a collective global system built around a green climate agenda. COVID was very important because COVID shows our interdependence. It shows that we really are a global civilization and we must therefore use that to prepare for our next pandemic or our next global crisis or our combined battle against climate change. We need a new social contract, a universal system of healthcare tapped into digitization. We need some type of new global taxation structure. We need living wages. This is what being, is being discussed. And these global goals can only be realized through our national policies as we all agree to this together. And if you have a corporation, if you're engaged in economics or in auditing, um, it's the ESG standards. That's where we're going. If you're a company um, and if you, have to, if you want access to markets, if you want to have licensing given to you to engage in economic activity, the real push right now is to have your countries be ESG certified. That is a World Economic Forum platform uh, ESG means environmental, social, and governance auditing. So your company is audited. What is your climate risk mitigation? Um, how much diversity do you have on your board? Um, how much funding are you giving to special interest groups? What is your involvement in pr promoting the climate change agenda? On and on and on. And so you have an auditing system with a number of metrics that your company now has to be funneled through. And if it meets that auditing standard, if it gets the ESG goals, you get the big thumbs up, here's your seal of approval, you can engage in business. If you don't, you may be shut out of the marketplace. And so there's incredible pressure through your supply chain on the downward side now to make sure the rest of the down chain, your supply chain is compliant. Last year, during the Davos agenda, the CEO of Coca-Cola made that very clear. We are, we are pushing our supply chain to be ESG compliant. That's where it goes. And then to the personal level, behavior modification, specifically through digitization. We all have this, and your cars all have this. And so all of this, all of this is constantly submitting data. So we will build brand new platforms to control your purchasing behavior. So we can see how compliant you are. And what does it all entail? This is from the World Economic Forum. In the center is the Great Reset. And if you go through this chart, everything from batteries to LGBTQ issues, from COVID-19 to justice and law, any segment of culture that you can think of will fall underneath their umbrella to some extent. All this has to be reshaped around the Great Reset. It all has to change. We're gonna conclude really quick. I wanna read you a little section of my book. This is from Maurice Hindus, a journalist in the 1930s, what he was observing in the Soviet Union. As you consider this and how complex and detailed it is, this is what he writes about as he was watching the Soviet Union engage in management, because that's what this is. This is management, global management. The plan envisages the recasting of society into a new mold. Man's eye is no longer the center of things. It is an organic part of the aggregate, or as the Russians say, of the mass. In the basic things of life, the individual cannot sunder himself from the mass without inviting disaster and even destruction. Boy. In the chief calculations of the government, it is the mass 
that counts. And everything that man as an individual needs comes to him by the grace and the force of the plan for the mass. The plan is the lifeblood of everything and everybody. Everything you do is part of the plan. You dig a ditch, you plant potatoes, you heave bricks, you blast rock, you study medicine. It is all part of the plan. You buy shoes, you decorate a house with pictures, you install a telephone, you eat canned tomatoes. It is all the result of the plan. There is no schoolhouse, cooperative farm or factory that has not a plan of its own which fits into some other plan in which like a riverlet that flows into a river on its way to the ocean, this does not in the end become part of the one plan. I have seen dances and songs and games and plays that center in the idea and the emotion of the plan. And that, gentlemen, is what this is about. That is our Tower of Babel. So where is it going? Next year, the hope, the anticipation of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum is that they are looking at promoting and putting together a, a conference called the World Futures Summit to see how we can bring about a plan. I'm going to leave you with this. This is Jean Stapleton. For those of us who remember her as an actress, she was also a promoter of world federal government. Consider the messianic overtone because that's what this is. The goal of the World Federalists is peace through unity of government. We must support their vision of oneness in diversity, for it is the salvation of humanity. I don't think it can be any clearer than that. Um, our time, Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Just one, one problem with that plan, and it's called sin. It just gets in the way. And thank God that one day we will have a, a, a leader that will come and rule the earth in righteousness and justice. And uh, that's exciting. Uh, this is uh, how is that? How is it coming with the heads coming out of the sand here? It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty revealing a lot of this stuff. And if you don't think it gets close to home, go on the websites of some of the big corporations that are that are around. Go on. Uh, Roquette just built a billion dollar project in Portage the Prairie, phase one of three. Go on their website and look at who they are. It's like a page right out of the UN, everything that they are and represent. So it's here, it's all around us, it's happening, and uh, it's it's close to home. So um, we're going to take about a 15, 20 minute break just to stand up, move around, go to the bathroom, and then we'll have our uh, third session, and then lunch will follow that. So, so just to remind